Let me just ask you a question. Are you close to your God? Do you feel like you're walking close to your God? Very, very important question to answer. I want us to pray real quick. I want you to pray a very simple prayer. Father, open the eyes of my understanding. Father, speak to me through your word. And what I hear, I will give you glory and I will obey. Just a simple prayer. Just a simple prayer. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for your precious word. And God, as we open it up, I pray, Lord, that uh, our hearts will just be enthralled with you. You are worthy of our worship. You are our God. And besides you, there is no other Savior. You're our hope. Our anticipation is in you. And so, Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have in this nation, that we can come and worship in this way. And we just thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, yesterday I got home and I saw on the news something going on happening at a mall. And I go, oh, no, what happened this time? And then you guys saw this guy, a lone gunman, killed at least 20 people, injured another 20-something people. And you think to yourself, this, this is insanity. And I was angry. I was telling my son what I'd like to do with that guy to save the country money, uh, just to tap him in the head and just save us, you know. But... I saw that, and I was just rather disgusted. And, but our world, y'all, so much is going on in our world, so much injustice, so much pain, so much evil, so much tragedy. Everywhere I look, somebody's dying, somebody is just suffering some great injustice. And uh, I, w I saw another video of this one precious man. He went to a uh, place in, in New York where... It was primarily a uh, homosexual, lesbian uh, area, very strong. Everybody in that area, very pro. And this guy's just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this really flaming gay guy, really effeminate guy, wearing a purse, you know, one of these kind. Uh, and then I, I know not all homosexuals are like that, but that's the way he was. He was a very effeminate person. And... And, but he was talking to the guy. He says, why are you here? And the guy said, I'm, I'm here to share the gospel with you. And he said, don't you understand what community this is? And he goes, yeah, but you need Jesus as well. He says, well, I just want to know one thing from you. Do you think homosexuality is a sin? And then the guy said, well, look, we're all sinners. But, of course, the guy kept pressing him in and saying, do you think homosexuality is a sin? And he said, well, the Bible says it's a sin. And he says, you're a hater. Anybody that believes that homosexuality is a sin is a hater. And next thing you know, people are doing things to this guy, yelling at him, taking his stuff. And, and he's being assailed uh, by the homosexual community there, whether they were homosexuals or not. And so we see this intolerance growing towards us. And in the last days, this is going to increase more and more. And we are only one generation from losing our freedom in this country. Do you guys understand that? One generation away. It only takes one generation to go super liberal, super progressive, and then everything can change. The Constitution, everything and so, well, Tony, are you here to talk about politics? No. What I'm here to talk about is don't put your trust in this world because this world is headed to a place of destruction. The Bible has made it very clear what the future holds. 
it made it very clear what this world must go through before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we are at the very end of those last days. And we are watching these things come to pass. And so do not find your security in the Republican Party or any political party because your view of old-time uh, white picket fence American Christianity, it's history. All right, We are rapidly approaching um, an era in which the Word of God is going to be assailed. Persecution is going to uh, increase. Well, you will be despised simply for what you believe. All right? That's what's coming our way. And if you don't have a deep, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to get very discouraged. You're going to be filled up with fear. There's going to be so many things that the enemy will use in your life to bring disappointment and discouragement. But y'all, if there's anybody in this world that should not be disappointed and discouraged, it's us. Rome was anything but fair. Rome ministered anything but justice in the time of Paul. It was a difficult place. The vast majority of the population were slaves. It was the elitists who had everything. Most people were poor. Uh, there was so much uh, uh, injustice there, so much sin there uh, was there. And, and yet in the midst of this, Paul writes this awesome letter. And he's been bringing them consolations. And, and you and I have to have these consolations as well. I've, I've mentioned four so far. And uh, uh, the first one was that, that the suffering that you and I have or will have in this world cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us in that day. The second consolation that I mentioned to you was that one, our full adoption as sons hasn't taken place yet. Uh, uh, we will be revealed for who we are down the road. And the third consolation... Uh, while we are waiting for our glorification, while we are waiting for the redemption of our bodies, we have the Holy Spirit who is making intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. You groan, creation groans, even the Holy Spirit groans with words that cannot be uttered, all anticipating that day of glory. And last week we talked about our predestination for glory. And I read Romans 28 through 30. I'm going to read it again because I just want to make a couple of comments um, before we move on. You all know this verse well. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also Glorified. Now, please understand, every bit of this is from God's perspective. Thus, everything is seen here as past tense. It's already been accomplished. Paul is describing God in eternity. He's looking at God's plan from a completed uh, perspective. Time just has to catch up. And so, Paul is looking at God as saying, okay, those that I knew beforehand, I did also predetermined. Those that I predetermined, I called. Those that I called, I justified. Those that I justified, I glorified. Every bit of that is past tense. Now, for those of you that are true believers, okay, it's a done deal. This is called the golden chain of salvation. Y'all, no believer, no true believer can lose their salvation. You understand me? Because every true believer has experienced all of these things in the mind of God. Every true believer in the mind of God is already glorified. 
You say, well, I'm not glorified. No, you're still in the justified time. But have you ever read the book of Revelation? You ever look at those big crowds up there? You're in there. You're already there. That's already happened. It's been written down. You read about in the future, but from God's perspective, it's already taken place. We've already been glorified. And because God inhabits eternity, according to Isaiah 57, 15, he lives in one continuum, past, present, and future. There is no time. God inhabits eternity. And we're going to talk about the complexity of that. This is why I tell you, when it comes to philosophical, systematic theologies, trying to explain all this stuff, yes, you need to study it. But let me tell you, you're never going to figure it out. The last thing you need to do is to make a big box and put God in it and nail the lid shut. What a boring God if you can do that. Amen? God is so much bigger than what we can imagine. He's so much greater than our wisdom. And, and so this God who is eternal and awesome, say it says that he has known us beforehand um, they, because we're in Christ. Think about this, y'all. The moment you are in Christ, you are now in his Alpha and Omega, because Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. This is why you can be buried with him, you know, die with him, be buried with him, and risen with him, and be glorified in him, because he's the past, he's the present, and the future. When you were not in Christ, you were not in the Alpha and the Omega. Once you are entered into Christ, you are entered into his person. You are baptized as part of his body, and you are part of him in his past, present, and future. It's an amazing concept. And so every believer has been before determined to be conformed, that is, sumorphos, having the same form to be conformed to the image of Christ, icon of Christ, like the icon is like a statue, that you and I have been determined to be morphed (laughs) together with Christ, to be exactly like Jesus Christ. And we were all kalesis, which means to invite, to be invited out loud, um, to, to come to Jesus, and we were justified, which means to be made righteous. And you and I are made righteous by faith, and then we're glorified. Now remember, faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Amen? God doesn't start a plan and not finish a plan. Maybe you do, but God doesn't. He is going to do what he said. This is why Paul said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Do you believe that? You know, if the Lord is for us, who can be against us? Which comes to the fifth consolation I want to share with you. Thank you for that song, sister, because that's exactly where I'm going this morning. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Now listen, Paul, in chapter 8, if you were to make Romans a, a, a golden ring, Romans 8 would be the diamond in the ring to me. Paul is saying, what shall we say to these things? What, what things? Um, He he mentions all these spiritual realities, and these realities are intended to have an effect. And what are the realities? There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. We are free from the law of sin and death. He promised that 
that he that raised Christ from the dead will raise us up from the dead and give life to our mortal bodies. That he gave us the spirit of adoption. He made us his children. He made us heirs, joint heirs with Christ. He promised that the glory that we will share with him is incomparable with anything we will suffer in this world. He promised our glorification uh, of our bodies. He's given us the earnest of the Spirit, the first fruit of the Spirit as a promise guarantee, and he ever lives to make intercession for you. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? Now here's the thing. This, this is what the difference is between reading the Bible and having ears that hear, and studying and meditating. If you just read the words, you go, okay, blah, 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 blah. But if you meditate upon it, you will see that you are dangling on a little string over the lake of fire because you believe not, and you were a child of wrath, and condemnation. He that believes not is condemned already. So you're at a state of wrath. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 1, to remember that in times past, you too were children of wrath. But now by the grace of God, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been saved. You've been seated. You, in, in Christ, you've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what Paul is saying in Romans 8 is that when you were saved, God took that little thread that was holding you up over the lake of fire and he turned it into a golden chain of redemption that's unbreakable. And you're removed from that condemnation and you're placed in Christ and you're forever safe and secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, have we become so dull of hearing that that doesn't excite us anymore? Do you understand the great salvation that God has given to me? See, I'm telling you, even even in this small crowd here, do you think I do not see some of you? Some of you are not even paying attention to anything I'm saying right now. I see you, okay? And it's like, why are you here? What does this, doesn't this mean anything to you? Have, have you come to church so often to where, what is so wonderful and beautiful and awesome, which should thrill your soul? You know, to me, it's kind of like marriage is you know, we can, we can be married and we can really love our mate, but we take one another for granted. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Maybe some of the guys in trouble right now. Uh, don't mean to, but it's just for illustration. You know, what, what if you were dads, husbands, what if you were about to die? Say you got in a car accident, or accident and you could feel your life drifting away. What would your last words be? you realize you are no longer going to be with the people that you love. What would you say? It might be something like this. Please tell my wife how much I love her. Please tell my children how much I love them. Let them know the last thing I'm thinking about in this world. I'm thinking about them. Please, please let them know. Or perhaps, you know, a time maybe you just realize you're married, living, single, because we can get like that. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? You can just take your relationship for granted. But how special are those times when God wakes us up and realize that we're to love our, li- our wives as Christ loved the church, and we look into our wives' eyes and say, you know, it's been a long time since I've told you this in the way that I'm about to tell you this. But I want you to know, I love you with all of my heart. You are a treasure to my soul. 
And you see, I believe that only the Holy Spirit can help us do that in Christ. Where we can, just like in our marriage, we take marriage for granted and those that we love for granted. And we can take our salvation for granted and forget about the one who loves us with an everlasting love, who more than anything wants us to draw close to him and share a spiritual intimacy with one another. And yet we get caught up with life, TV shows, video games. God catch you later. When I've got time, oh, I know this, I know that. The Bible is facts to us. The Bible is, oh, man, I'm, looking, we're, I'm like an Athenian. You know, I'm looking for something new. Tell me something new. Sensationalize me. But see, that's not what it's about. It's about relationship. And this verse, Paul is saying, what, what should you say to all of this stuff? You should say, wow, awesome, God, me, you love me like that? You did that for me? I was an enemy. I hated you. I had no life. I, uh, God, why? Why would you love me like this? Why would you do anything like this for me? God, you tell me these things are mine. What can I say? The only thing I can say is, wow. But then Paul is saying, not only should you say, wow, but I want you to understand your security. If God is for you, who can be against you? Notice if. If God is for you, God isn't for everyone. If God is against you, we can ask the question, who can be for you? How can you stand? How can you face a holy God? How can you face his divine holiness and justice? How can you survive his judgment? when he makes you stand before him and every word, every thought, every action, every motivation is laid out before you and your sin is laid out bare and you are being judged by perfect righteousness, perfect justice. You will not stand in that day. Now, if God is for you, who can be against you? What's the worst anybody can do? They can take your stuff. Well, my heart's in heaven, and that's where my treasure is. They can't touch that. They could banish me. They can exile me. They can put me away. But Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll kill you, Tony. My life is hidden in Christ. You can't take my life. It doesn't belong to you. <laughs> They can threaten me. Then I will say, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Y'all, if God calls you to do something, he is going to give you the strength to do it. Amen? There's nothing. Faithful is he who calls you who is also who also will do it. I like Psalms 56, 9 through 11. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Though all of Satan's crew, though all of Satan's entourage, the insanity of this world comes against you, you are impervious, you are protected, you are empowered. Let this promise be on your lips, y'all, that what God asks you to do, he will perform it that there's nothing that the enemy can do against you. Your lives are so supernaturally protected and charmed in Christ. And the safest place you and I can be 
is in the will of God. This is what Paul is showing. How God, look at how God showed he is for us. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Y'all, go back to Calvary. Go back to this very dark, ugly place of execution and behold the Lamb. Would you just take a moment in your mind's eye and just picture you at the foot of the cross and Jesus suffering everything he suffered for you? Are you worthy of that? Did you deserve that? You're guilty. You're a sinner. And yet there he was suspended between heaven and earth. Sin met love. Grace was born. God won. God won today. And hear the words of Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Aren't you glad for the heart of God? Can you see his bleeding? Can you see the wounds on his body? Can you hear him groaning in his agony? Can you see the kind of open shame that he was placed into the fact that he despised every every moment of it but the bible says he endured it he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself why for the joy that was set before him guess what you're that joy he saw you in glory with him conformed to his image with a redeemed body, a lovely bride, eternal, spiritual, loving intimacy shared for the rest of eternity. And I don't understand it, but that's what kept Jesus on the cross. That's what kept Jesus on the cross was what was going to be purchased by the blood that he shared. He took our sin. He took our guilt. He endured everything until everything that was required of him was finished. And he said, die." the debt has been paid. He was our Jehovah Jireh. You know, Abraham learned that in Genesis chapter 22 as Abraham was about to plunge a dagger into the heart of his son, Isaac, God interrupted it and provided a ram trapped in a bush. And y'all, the dagger of judgment was about to come down on us. And Jehovah Jireh, God provided a lamb on the cross. Can we ever get into our lives where we don't cease to be so thankful? Where we're not just in wonderment and awe? Because you see, the most boring Christianity on the planet is intellectual Christianity. So many Christians don't even read the Bible anymore because they treat it like it was a story. Okay, I read that story. I know that. I know that. I know that. But the Bible is the Word of God. And the Bible invites us to sit down with Jesus and to fellowship and to break bread with him. And then he which has been called to come alongside of us to help us takes the word of God, takes the things of Jesus Christ, the deeper things of God, the profound things of God, the blessed things of God, the awesome things of God, the loving things of God, and he shows them to us And then we go, bless the Lord, oh my soul. That's how it works. Where is your walk with God? Are you enthralled more with Jesus today than ever before? Do you still have those moments with him where your spirit just rises up within you and you go, wow, 
Wow, where tears come to your eyes. When's the last time tears came out of your eyes in contemplation and meditation of who Jesus is and what he has done for you and the relationship that you have with one another? Or is your faith more intellectual? Because if it is, you are one bored individual. And the only thing that will sustain you is new information. You're like the Athenians, always something new, always the next, the next fix, the next big gimmick to keep you going. And y'all, that's what the majority in the church today is looking for. But what about you? Are you more in love with him today than ever before? It says, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That word freely give us, you know, the word for grace is charis, and, which is a noun. And in the Greek, if you want to make a noun a verb, you take this little Greek participle, zomai, and you put it to the end. And the Greek, here, Greek word here is charisomai, graced. How shall he not grace us with all things? What is grace? God giving you what you don't deserve. If God has given you your best, how much more, or, or how shall he not with him also grace you with all things? Ephesians 1, 3 through 7 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, this should make you happy. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of of his grace. Wow. God has already graced us, y'all, with the greatest gift, and that is his son as our savior and as our redeemer. What lesser gift? Let me ask you, what lesser gift will he not give? If he's given you the greatest gift, what lesser gift will he not give? If he's already paid the highest price, Will he hesitate at all to pay a lower price? I don't think so. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If God gave you everything in his son, he will not withhold any good thing from his own children. I preached this a long time ago, but it's an illustration I've never forgotten. And it's about a poor European family that was saved up for years to take a, a, a ship to, to America. And when they got on board, all they had were a couple of suitcases and a food stash of nothing but bread and cheese. And they measured out the bread and cheese for how much time it would take them to take a ship to America. And so, what's for breakfast, Dad? Bread and cheese. What's for lunch, Dad? Bread and cheese. What's for supper, Dad? Bread and cheese. Every day, bread and cheese. And one day, his oldest son said, Dad, I am so sick and tired of bread and cheese. I think if I eat any more bread and cheese, I'm simply going to die. And so, the dad in grace gave his son a nickel, and he says, just go down and get some ice cream. And so the kid's so excited, he goes down and to get some ice cream, and he was gone for a long time, and the parents are beginning to worry about him. Where is he at? And just as they were about to go try and find him, he comes in with this giant smile on his face. And they say, he says, son, where have you been? He says, well, I went down to the galley, and I got some ice cream. Matter of fact, I got three of them, and I had a steak dinner. And the dad looked at him and says, son, all of that with a nickel? He says, he says, no, dad, I found out that with the journey comes free food. 
And see, they were eating steak or, or, or uh, sand bread and cheese every day and not realizing how fully the father or how fully the, the, the ticket uh, included everything for the journey. They didn't know that. And God wants us to understand that. Salvation is more than just escape from from hell. It's more than just forgiveness of sin and a safe passage over to heaven. It includes everything we need for the journey. All of that is in Christ. And I just fear that too many people are eating cheese and and bread when they can be experiencing all the other good things. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. God is saying, come and buy of me that which cannot be bought. It'll make you fat. Your soul will get fat. You'll find it's a blessing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Look at 33. Who shall bring a charge against God elect, God's elect? It is God who justifies. A charge means to call into debt to accuse. Psalms 51.4 says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Listen to me, y'all. God is the only one that's in position to charge you for sin. Because all your sin is against God. Only one can accuse you. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Um, The word here, eklektos, it means to be called out, selected. Uh, Sometimes, well, oftentimes it's translated chosen. Um, How do you bring an accusation against somebody that God has called out for himself for glorification? How do you do that? It doesn't work. You know, this is the first time that Paul uses this word elect, and we're going to be discussing this concept of election in chapter 9. Who are God's elect? When are they chosen? How are they chosen? How does it work? We're going to be looking at all of that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But Paul is merely asking a question. If God has chosen you to be his, who can bring an accusation or a demand against you to forfeit your salvation? It is God who declares you righteous. Did you know that a human judge can only acquit you? But no human judge can justify you? Have you ever thought about that? The best thing a judge can do is acquit you. But God not only acquits you, but he justifies you. He gives you the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. For God made Jesus to be sin, though Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Y'all... How much safer can a person be than having the righteousness of Christ? And see, so many times you guys fail and you see yourself in your disobedience. You see yourself in your failure, but God sees you in Christ. You are accepted in the beloved. The devil wants you to get your eyes off the one who justifies and to put your eyes on your sinful flesh so you don't so you will be accused or when the accuser says you're guilty you'll go i am guilty isn't it something in revelation 12 it says that satan stands as the accuser day and night before the brethren every day of eternity satan comes in and he let's just i'll just Pick yourself. I'll pick you, Nathaniel, over there. Satan will come to God and say, let me tell you about Nathaniel. Do you think he's going to lie to God? No, because I would, I'm pretty much sure Nathaniel doesn't live a perfect life, right? (laughs) Does anybody here? No. No. But he lives in the perfect one. All the accusations are met in the perfect one. And God the Father says, justified. 
acquitted and justified because my son paid that debt. And not only did my son pay that debt, but the righteousness of my son has been imputed to Nathaniel. So he is as righteous as I am. You're looking at his actions. The father looks at the action of the son, the once and for all payment for our sin that forever justifies those that believe in him. Y'all, will you give me just a few minutes to finish this? I want to get out of chapter 8. Can you, can you give, me, give me just a few minutes? I won't be long, I promise you. Look at verse 34. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. If a man can't bring a charge against you, how can he condemn you? You can only condemn somebody that has an active charge set against them. But if there's no charge that stands, nobody can condemn you, especially when the judge is your friend, when the judge is your brother, when the judge is the one who paid your debt and suffered in your behalf. You expect that judge to condemn you? He's just going to say to the person bringing an accusation, get out of here. My blood answers for that. And the Father listens to Jesus interceding for us because the Father honors him. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's at that place of favor. And he has accepted his son. He loves his son. And we are accepted in the beloved. And you and I are as accepted before God as Jesus Christ himself because we have been given the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Y'all, I am telling you these things to console you, to encourage you, because some of you might be down on yourselves. But don't look at yourself in your flesh. Look at yourself in Christ and let that be the impetus to go, what am I doing? Why am I not spending time in God's Word? Why am I not sharing my faith? Why am I not doing all of these things that I know I should be doing? Y'all, that was intended, those things are intended to be done out of love. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our problem is that we try to intellectually live our, our Christianity, and we know all of this stuff, but it won't get us moving our mouth and moving our feet and moving our hands for the kingdom. Only a loving relationship. How can we be quiet? How can we not serve him? How can we not give him our all? It's very simple. Just know him intellectually. Just let the mind have precedent over the heart and the spirit. And then you got churchianity. And then your life's going to be so bored, all you're going to do is think about what all's wrong with the church and we need to do this and we need to do that. But you know what? When I fell in love with Sabrina, I didn't care about anybody or anything. I mean, I love deer hunting. I remember, man, I'm sitting there going, Lord, I'm reading love letters. I'm supposed to be hunting deer. I didn't care about deer. All I cared was, Oh, baby, I miss you, man. So I just read her letter over and over and over again. When am I going to see her the next time? When are we going to embrace one another? When are we going to talk on the phone? Boy, I'm convicting myself right now. <laughs> Cut that part out. All right. <laughs> Finally, this is the fifth consolation. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril or sword? I was going to explain all those terms. I'll simply just say no. In this life, we can have a lot of tribulation. The world can rise up against us. They can put us to death. There's a lot of things that can happen to us in this life. But nothing is going to separate us from the word 
of our love of God. And then he quotes Psalms 44 and verse 36. That is written, as it is written for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And I invite you to read Psalms 44 in context because it's not talking about an Israel that sins. It's talking about an Israel that suffers the consequences of a fallen world who hates the chosen people of God and merely persecutes simply because they are the people of God. And as it has been given us to believe on him, it is also given to us to suffer for his namesake. And suffering just comes with the territory. We've already talked about this. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love them. In these things, in the midst of these things, and all that I am saying, we are more than conquerors. We are overcomers through Christ who loves us. And then verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth or any other, any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can put space between you and God. God loves you so much and he proved that by giving his own son. Y'all, this is the God that we should fall in love with over and over and over again. This is where we need to repent before God and say, God, I'll put a romantic novel before you. I'll put Facebook before you. I'll put TV before you. I'll put personal entertainment before you. I'll put my video games before you. I'll put my reputation before you. I'll put my job before you. I'll put my money before you. I'll put my family before you. But I'll go to church. I'll be a good person. I'm a believer. Is that what Jesus died for? Is that the kind of church that he died for? Or does he want a bride that's holy? A bride who's sanctified unto him, who holds him as her first love. What shall we say to these things? What what more can God do? What more can God say? See, this is where we're at. Nothing. You know, I've seen a lot of marriages fall apart. I've seen marriages fall apart right here in this church. But the bride in Christ, the bride of Christ and Jesus will never separate. There will never be a divorce. Nothing. Nothing in life. No created thing. Nothing in time, space, history. No failure on your part can separate you from the love of God if you truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is good news, y'all. I'm going to challenge you with something. We're coming into Romans 9, 10, and 11. Natalie, I know Romans 9 is one of your favorite chapters in all the Bible. I'm going to ask you to do a favor for me. Over the next 10 weeks, I'm going to ask that you read Romans 9 through 11 one time a week. And I'm praying that not only will you read it, but you will study it and meditate upon it and look at context. I'm praying that when the Old Testament scriptures are quoted, that you will look up the text, that you will look for the flow. This is a big, big, big super chapter for a group of people called Calvinists. Romans uh, Romans 9 and John 6. These are the big go-to chapters. So um, when people say that Calvinists don't use scripture for their beliefs, you're dead wrong. They do use scripture, and this is a major portion of scripture that they go to. But 9-11, chapter 9 isn't about Calvinism. (laughs) 
chapters 9 through 11 is about why is Israel blind? What, what's God's plan for Israel? Why has God allowed what has happened to Israel to happen? Why has God withdrew, withdrawn his mercy from Israel? See, these are the questions that are asked and answered in these three chapters. And if you go to chapter 9 and you emphasize, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, well then please go to chapter 11 where Paul says, so that I might have mercy on all. Try to stay out of your philosophical systematic and pray with all of your heart, God, open the eyes of my understanding. And if you come out to the end of chapter 11 and you're still a Calvinist, praise the Lord. If you come out at the end and you're not, praise the Lord. But at least try to read this not through theological, philosophical, theological eyes. Because it's really all about the mystery of Israel's blindness. And when you get to the end, as I said from the very beginning, remember, God's judgments are unsearchable unless you have an ego the size of the universe. His ways are past finding out unless you have an ego the size of the universe. His ways are unsearchable, okay? Or his, his judgments are unsearchable, his ways past finding out. You know what that tells me? When you go in there and you try to nail God into a box, you are trying to do something that's impossible. And don't get caught up into this world of that. Don't take a 16th century systematic theology and force it into the text, whether it's Arminian or whether it's Calvinist or something in between. Because what God wants you to do is to go, wow, how unsearchable are his judgments. How are his ways past finding out because that's what Paul broke into, a concophony of praise when he wrote chapters 9 through 11. And if, amen. (laughs) So, we'll just end there. Thank you for letting me finish that. Isn't God's word good? And y'all, please, Be patient with me. I'm a very flawed individual. I know that's shocking to some of you, but I'm very flawed. And I don't know everything. And there are scholars much smarter than I, much more studied than I. And uh, I admit that. But I'm going to do my very best, given the, the audience, the age ranges, the maturity levels, to try to share with you my understanding of Romans 9 through 11. I'm not going to try to convince you into a theological system because that system is unsearchable. It's past finding out. So my brain or my head is not as big as the universe. I admit to you, there's so much mystery. There's so many things I don't understand. And so I'm going to just try to be as honest with the text as I can, but Am I biased? Yes. I'm absolutely biased. And I will bring my traditions to the text. And any of you that say that you can do it and not do it, you need to repent because you're either outright lying or you're deceiving yourself. And so let us just come to the text honest and say, God, I don't want to get caught up into a theological system. I want to be wowed by you, who you are, that you're so big and you're so awesome that when we get to chapter, the end of chapter 11, I'm just going, oh, man, absolutely incredible. God is so good. Isn't that a better way to approach it? I think so. Will you stand?
Okay, y'all. Examination time. The word has been given. What has the Holy Spirit spoken to your heart? In any way, has he opened the eyes of your understanding? What is your true heart relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you really in love with him? Is, does his love compel you? Or are you just kind of on automatic because it's just what you do? Because Jesus to the church of Ephesus said, you've left your first love. You left. Are you putting anything ahead of Jesus? And I'll include myself. Are we putting anything ahead of Jesus? And if God shows you something this morning, don't harden your heart. Just do what you need to do and repent and then go back to your first works when you love Jesus Christ with all of your heart, when you are completely unashamed. Because what can we say to these things? The only thing we should be able to say is, oh God, I'm so unworthy. I love you so much. Thank you for this great salvation. I'm yours, Lord. You have purchased me. I'm yours. I repent from my, my independence I'm your servant. I'm here to glorify you. And maybe you just need to, to tweak your life a little bit and to give God back that which you have walked away from. Father, we love you. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for this rain that you are sending. And Father, rain blessings upon us. Oh, God. Speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Father, we confess all too often we take things and put it in front of you. And Father, I pray that you would deliver us from mundaneness, from mediocrity, from intellectualism. And Father, help us to come back to our first love. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.